Thank you all for joining us in what will undoubtedly be the most interesting discussion you'll come to today. How can we not with this many people on a sofa? <laughs> As was said, so this is an attempt to get behind the hype and share real stories about what's happening within the industry um, using AI. Um, the panel is a wonderful mix of CEOs and founders, um, ex-leaders of large institutions, um, people who have a very specialized background in security. It, it's going to be a sort of wide-reaching um, but very tangible discussion. And so to get us started, I thought we'd get everybody talking about what they think is the most interesting application of AI in financial services. Um, and in order to not go in order, Claire, if I can get you to start telling us some stories about what you're seeing and what gets you excited. If I, if I take the concepts that they were discussing on uh, how can you get better and what is the future of financial services, what I'm very excited about is the fact that we are going real time. So all the data that have been captured in application is now moving you know, uh, more and more to be agile, accessible, and to have real-time system to manage better credit, liquidity, ESG data. And this is really enabling us to have use cases in ESG, which I think are solving some of the biggest problem in the world, like climate change, you know, creating new uh, material, new data, uh, and new data for market as well. So I'm super excited about that. Yes, I'm next. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm from GitHub. So um, I've been talking about Copilot for the last year, year and a half. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I'm very bullish. I'm very excited about things that are happening. And, and what was just recently announced or published uh, last week in the media in the US is um, you know, City has just decided to deploy it to all of their developers, 40,000 developers. And, you know, and obviously, you know, using these generative AI uh, assisted pair programmers is very exciting, but they're also planning to use it to help solve other problems. So things like security, you know, how do we fix all of the bugs, all the security vulnerabilities in the code, and also how to address the problem of um, obsolete code bases. So things like COBOL, um, and, and, and you know, how do we modernize those applications? So I think that's very exciting. Uh, picking up on that, I, I love that example because it's an example of AI augmenting high leverage professionals. So we're seeing augmentation as opposed to sort of automating people out of the equation. I'm excited about that same paradigm playing out in financial services kinds of applications where you see high leverage professionals getting augmented by AI. And the example that I'd share uh, is one from a, a global investment bank where we rolled out uh, our unprompted AI to augment uh, their investment bankers. And, and we did it because of a very specific problem they were trying to solve, which was this bank has invested massively into data science, predictive analytics, uh, all sorts of real-time data feeds about what's going on in capital markets, proprietary research, but their bankers don't actually see it, especially the senior bankers, because they're too busy to access it. And so what we were able to do, and I think we'll come to themes like hyper-personalization in a bit, but we were able to use unprompted AI to understand the context of each of those bankers and proactively surface the insights they need at the right moment with the impact being that as they meet with clients or reach out to clients, they're more informed. And in the words of the, the bank's COO, sounding more informed is what wins. Very nice, thank you. Daisuke? Yeah, so hi everyone. I'm Daisuke Aranami. I'm from Microsoft Japan and I'm leading the uh, FSI team uh, for Japan. I just joined Microsoft in December last year, so it's been only three months. But uh, in the past three months, I had a great chance to see many CEOs, CIOs, CDOs, business line executives for the uh, Japanese financial institutions. And I'm observing huge, huge potential and interest, excitement from those executives. So I think you know, this time, finally, you know, big digital transformation opportunity is coming to Japanese uh, financial industry. So I'm so excited. I, we will see lots of changes you know, in the industry in the coming years. So there are advantages sitting with the moderator and there are disadvantages. All my answers are taken. Um, <laughs> but I'll, uh, I work, uh, I used to be at a, at a bank before and I now work at a uh, company that provides software to test and monitor AI. And the use case I'm quite excited about, it's only in the last six months, is the use of AI to test in an automated form the output from AI applications. I, I was a big skeptic as a traditional bank guy, 
but we're beginning to see this instances where small models, not the large language models, but small models used cleverly are beginning to en enable us humans to give some kind of quality assurance on the output from, from AI. So that's the most exciting one for me. Very nice. I think it would be, it would be easy to listen to those stories um, from a cost or productivity lens, right? So we're sort of co-pilots. We've got some process -y type. Let's do things better or more efficiently. Uh, are any of these stories top line or, heaven forbid, new revenue models? Or is it really that the value is on the cost and productivity side? Well, I think we're certainly seeing opportunities to drive revenue growth, right? Because when you have high professionals in high leverage roles, often they're in the role of driving new business, of prospecting, of going into conversations with clients where you're seeking to win business. And if they can go in with more strategic insights, the goal of the investment bank I mentioned earlier was for their bankers to be holistic advisors to their clients and to be able to walk in with an understanding of the total capability of their firm, the full portfolio of services that they can offer, and which of those are most likely to be the most useful to that client at a particular moment. And if they can do that, they're actually driving business that they wouldn't have driven otherwise. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it has both, you know, impacts. And uh, I actually had a very good discussion this morning with a uh, leading life insurer in Japan. And what we discussed was first, of course, in the process uh, automation. So uh, what they are thinking is uh, basically, you know, uh, leveraging Gen AI in the support desk for the, for the sales functions. And uh, they want to, you know, automate the support functions then you know, uh, they can replace uh, the, the human with the uh, Gen AI in that specific function. However, at the same time, they are trying to move those uh, resources for the support functions to the front end, like salespeople. So uh, then you know, they could generate more revenue from that you know, shift of their human resources. So that, that's something you know, we are seeing uh, happening in the financial industry. Yeah, we definitely implemented um a, a huge part of the portfolio in, in both of the banks where I worked, which were customer facing. So some of the examples were uh, prediction of ECM. So we were capable to screen the market and predict, you know, in, in advance, which type of deal, you know, in ECM the client or will buy. So that was one thing we implemented. Another one which, you know, was talked about a little bit in the previous panel was Callbot chatbot. So in our online bank, we are processing more than uh, 30,000 conversation uh, per month in the callbot or chatbot with a above 95% NPS success rate. So these were definitely, uh, you know, uh, things that were growing or contributing to the top line. Um, so you know what what I was mentioning this morning is in operation. When you calculate the value, you just go after a bigger pool at the moment, which are, you know, in traditional bank, easier to predict or to follow. So some of the areas on fraud management or some of the areas where we deployed uh, legal assistance, for example, when you operate deals to look at the clause. And basically, we've all been on calls where you're forever, you know, just uh, watching or rereading the documents. So that could be done automatically through AI. So there was just more, the pool of revenue were more clear and more easy to track, uh, where in top line, uh, how do you get the engagement of the business unit and make sure when they don't achieve their results, what happened exactly? So, you know, it's just a bit of uh, the accounting and the data value, uh, which for me get harder, but definitely there was, you know, 50-50 uh, without an issue. And, and maybe in an attempt to spark some discord between my panelists, um, it, it, if we just take a step back and then think about sort of the, the more thematic, you know, drivers of value for these these models, um, wh where do you see the value coming? Is it going to be in co-pilots and amplifying expert humans to do better? Is it going to be in automation? Is it going to be in hyper-personalization, which David, you've already mentioned, so maybe I'll throw this to you first. But where's, if I'm the CEO and I'm placing a bet, where do I place my bet today? Thank you. Um, it's um, the core challenge that we see is how do we get the AI to be able to be proactive so that we can transform the traditional pull paradigm where the burden is entirely on you as a user to figure out what information you need, when you need it, and go find it, 
which results a lot of the time in information not getting used, into a world where we have intelligent AI-driven push, we, we call it um, unprompted AI. Uh, the challenge, though, is if you just push information to users and it's not hyper-personalized, it's not going to be relevant, you're just dumping noise on them. The information overload gets even worse. So it's only when you have AI that can actually understand the user's context, understand their business goals, understand what they're trying to achieve, and understand how those are changing over time so they understand that context right now, then you can take this next step to a, an AI agent type push paradigm, but it's hyper-personalization that really enables that. And maybe just one more brief comment on, on how to do that, and, and we work very closely with Microsoft and integrate into the Microsoft graph, because it turns out that if you look at a user's information footprint, you can get a pretty good sense of who they're collaborating with, and what themes are important to them and what relationships they're working on. We also integrate into CRM and we use what we call personal data fusion that is inspired by military intelligence technology applications to understand that context and drive the hyper-personalization. Oh yes, the rebuttal from the uh, co-pilot, perfect. <laughs> I guess we'll talk about co-pilot now. Um, so. <laughs> Yeah, so I think if you look at the way that Copilot's been evolving over the last year or so, you know, it, it has taken that sort of approach of the, the very highly personalized or very specialized um, use cases. So you have, you know, you have your Copilot that sits in the, the development environment of the developer, and it's tuned for writing code, and it's very good at generating code, but that's really what it's, it's meant to do, and that's all it really does, it'll, or it'll allow you to do. Um, and we see, you know, additional functionality being added to all different aspects of the, the life cycle. So, you know, if you have a developer that's, you know, checking in new code, they've just made some new functionality, it needs to be, it needs to have a review, um, it will start documenting that code for you. So it, it understands what you've changed and understands what the impact is, and it can auto-generate, you know, all of the different changes, and you can do all your change management processes with that. And so having these highly specialized co-pilots within the workflows, I think this is the direction that we see going. So I think that's very similar to, you know, it's, 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 it's you know, particular for software development, but I think it's a, a model that has been very successful. So I think a lot of lessons can be gleaned from that. Uh, I think if you were asking me where I will put my money, so what are the enablers, what we need to recognize is the system is less and less one size fits all. So it gets more and more personalized, and I tune, and I think the stack will verticalize, so I will bet on things that are more specialized. I don't think the generalist you know, technology will can apply to everything. I think we need verticalization, so that's one thing. I will look at things like um, that manage the data rights properly, uh, and can do that on structured, unstructured data. And here I'm asking you to not think about just data on databases, but data because that come from video, that come from pictures, because I think it will come more and more as part of our data today. So how do you manage data rights in such a complex environment in real time is where I will bet my money. And therefore, you know, I will also by derivative look at graph technology and what it can do. Um, so that would be important. And last but not least, and this is your point, I would definitely invest in everything that goes around security of generative AI. You know, everything that's secure, that can do a clear governance. I think, you know, as we pass through rack technology, fine tuning, everything, we know that the answer are not 100% the same at the moment. And therefore, if you work in an FSI, you want your answer to be always the same. So how can we secure that in order to have large-scale use cases? Where I will not invest is all the startups that burn their cash in hardware technology and learning cheap, because I think you know, in seven, 12 months, this is going to be commoditized evenly, and we will switch to an inference uh, type of thinking. So having promoted myself to CEO a second ago, I think I'll put my CTO hat on and follow up on what you both said about specialization. Um, I, I guess I've just gone through the process of setting up my Microsoft stack and exclusively using the Azure um, capabilities. Do I need to be worrying about specialization? Do I need lots of different language models? Do I need very specific architectures for different use cases? Um, or am I okay just having my chatbot on the top and everything will be fine? Uh, you'll absolutely need um, 
more specialized pieces, unless your work is completely general, which I don't think anybody's work is. I think there's a difference between a personal assistant, which can indeed be a generalized personal assistant working on the entire internet. Now, that itself you could consider as a verticalized app. But for most financial institutions or, or any corporation, you will absolutely see a trend towards more specialization for a few reasons. First is it's completely unreliable if you just base it on like generic pieces. It's also costly. You don't need these very powerful models in many different contexts. So it's costly. It's, um, it's, it's, it's also insecure. Many companies will want to keep this, particularly in financial services, we want to keep the models inside our, inside our world. We want to use the data that is like kosher for our group. It's, it's approved for our group. Doing all of that means you should absolutely see more verticalized application, in my view. I'd love to chime in on that and, and agree with all of those points because what we're seeing is that when you actually need high levels of accuracy in demanding professional tasks and investment banking, asset management, corporate banking, you know, all certainly qualify, um, LLMs on their own as sort of generic language models can't get there. And we're presenting a paper at a Stanford AI conference next month entitled uh, can uh, LLMs answer investment banking questions? And we came up with a panel of relatively simple questions, and the answer turned out to be, in their generic form, a resounding no. Uh, but what we found was a very promising approach that could get to a relatively high level of accuracy relatively easily was to build, and I think this actually starts going in the GitHub direction, a, a more specialized hybrid AI system that's actually combining the LLMs for understanding of language and generation of language with other kinds of components. I think, Claire, you mentioned knowledge graphs a moment ago. That's definitely one of the technologies to consider, but knowledge graphs, structured inference, bringing those things in and combining them uh, to build a hybrid system that actually can achieve higher levels of performance, and, and maybe we can, we can then test it and make sure it's performing. Um. On the accuracy topic, uh, what's going on in, in the Japan financial market is basically because they cannot make an error in the customer-facing operations. So uh, they started from basically you know, the internal uh, process first, and uh, by, you know, in order to validate uh, you know, the effectiveness of uh, Gen AI, uh, they started using it in an internal sort of Q and A's, those kind of. So it, it, it's also a sort of testing process for them. Then you know, once approved, I think you know they could launch uh, moving to uh, you know customer facing operations. Uh, that's I think you know something ha happening in, in in the Japan market at the moment. That that's helpful. I mean, I, I guess I might see our hat back on again. I got a lot of paychecks coming this month. Um, <laughs> Are institutions all following the same pathway here? Right, if we're going down a path of specialization, multiple value creation archetypes, are other banks all doing the same thing? Are fintechs doing something the same or different? Are we seeing differences by region? Is there a template that I should follow? Or is this, there's a thousand opportunities and people are picking totally different paths? They start <laughs> looking at me. Uh, at least in Europe, uh, the regulator have started to emit uh, some guidelines on the way the CDO office should be structured. Uh, and we had a couple of regulatory programs following the Greek crisis around mapping data points on the, the liquidity system. Uh, and that have set the foundation uh, on how do you monitor your data flows. And what I will say is, some of the banks have led that from a risk perspective, and that was my case when I was in Lloyd's. Uh, I was uh, the risk product owner and leading this transformation uh, from a risk perspective, and you get your implementation uh, properly. And we've seen that in some other instance, especially when it started as an IT project, more than a risk management project from your liquidity points, uh, the results uh, ended up to be a bit more complicated on how do you manage your data flow and structure your data through your organization. Um, and I think here you see two paths uh, on the way the fundamentals of your data are dealt with. And based on that, after, we go back to how do I go further, manage my data rights, manage my data more holistically. And from there, because data is intrinsically linked to AI, you can get 
uh, your journey started on big AI use cases. Now, and this was my case in my previous organization, uh, this don't prevent you even if everything is not right from your data stack, from you know everything you got. We did manage to increase the value of the portfolio by properly tracking and defining across an organization which was 100, 130,000 people and 7,000 subsidiary. We did manage to define a common data value across four verticals uh, on customer operation and uh, improving uh, uh, you know, uh, more compliance, risk, and uh, uh, the rest. We managed to have a common library of AI assets that was great in order for each of the entity to see what was happening through the group. Uh, and we managed to have joint projects in order to pick some and to increase, for example, in fraud management, we had some that was working well. How can I increase it and manage it as a product? So I think that's one example of the journey. To your question, I think uh, I didn't see a, a path of standardization, but at least in Europe, because of the regulation and the standardization of the CDO office, I believe it will flow naturally uh, in, the in the next couple of years. So what I've seen is it, it really depends on the, I guess, maturity level or the, how advanced they are in their cloud adoption. You know, especially using GitHub Copilot, you know, this is something that you have to be cloud ready for. And, and you know, it's a big difference I see in Japan and other countries, because I cover all of, of APAC, um, is kind of the, 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 the cautiousness and, and, I guess, a conservative you know, approach to cloud adoption. And, and so that's kind of holding things back a bit. And, um, but, you know, I think for your cloud first organizations, your smaller um, fintech startups, um, usually they're, they're very quick to, to pick up on it, you know, your cloud native organizations. Yeah, I guess I'd just add to that, you know, we work with a lot of major banks across many geographies. And what we pretty consistently see is that there's a, there's a difference between sort of being cautious and being slow. So we actually see that some of the banks with the most sophisticated uh, risk management processes and AI governance processes and approaches for vetting security and cloud architecture are actually some of the ones that are moving relatively quickly because they're the ones that have recognized that in order to move quickly, they need to get really good at that. And so it, it might be that it's less of a distinction between whether they're, they're cautious or risk averse um, versus, versus agile and more whether they recognize that the biggest risk is not figuring out how to do this stuff and moving quickly on it versus those that are, are sort of afraid to, to embrace any of it. And as a result, they now have a stack that's so far behind the curve that it's really hard for them uh, to, to even know where to start. Because I think the reality is that until you have the cloud in place, Claire, you've, you've spoken about the importance of data you need to have all of those building blocks in place and all that infrastructure before you can start putting AI on top of it. Um, yeah, the, the um, untapped opportunity, what we need to do to unlock uh, the full potential of this uh, technology in financial services. Sure. So I think the untapped opportunity is one of scale, not of opportunity area. What I mean by that is if you look at all the experimentation with AI, people have more or less looked at every aspect, from coding to customer facing across the board. The real difference, and I think picking on your point as well, the real difference in value capture will be between those who really manage to go beyond those pilots into doing it, like not doing a little bit of code generation on the side, but saying, no, we're going to, I don't know, improve coding productivity by 30%, 40% across the board. That's the untapped opportunity. And in my mind, um, and I'm a bit biased because that's where I've gravitated to career-wise, the thing that you need to unlock it is, of course, all the enablers that Claire mentioned, the data, the, uh, all, all of those aspects. But the single biggest barrier for this industry is trust. As an industry, we don't have a physical product, uh, industry meaning financial services. All we have is data. All we have is mathematics on top of data, which pre claims that you have a right to this much money from me. So in an industry like this, we are all rightly extremely scared of producing stuff that is unreliable. So the number one thing that is going to make a difference in my mind is how do we build trust in AI? Not just for the regulators, that comes as a side effect. You should build trust for yourself. Will you be ready to stand behind your answer from the AI? Will your colleagues be agreeing to change the way they are working? You know, the investment managers, 
or the customer advisors, will they actually listen to what you're saying? I said, no, this, I've been doing this job for 20 years. Why am I going to believe this newfangled technology? Or finally, and most importantly, will your customers trust you, right? Those who are able to crack that are the ones who are going to capture the opportunity. And I'm going to finish with one small thing, which is I don't think it is the small fintech. I don't think it is the, the ones who don't have any risk management constraints. They are not going to win. They're going to end up like, was it Ford or whoever had, a, had two accidents in California with un, uh, you know, unmapped cars. They're going to end up like that. They're going to do early experiments and stop. The ones who will win will be the ones who have sophisticated risk management capabilities, who've tested it in the past with other technologies, and will now bring out the big guns and get it right for, the, for this side. I, I totally agree. And, uh, you know, what, what we are observing now in Japan is basically, uh, you know, lots of POCs, you know, trials, trials, trials. But, you know, I, I believe some of those POCs will come real uh, very soon. And once, you know, we see uh, real use cases, uh, you know, taking place uh, in, in, the, in the market, you know, everybody follows. So uh, really want to see, you know, the real example of the transformation leveraged by leveraging, you know, JNI. So that's something, you know, uh, for, you know, needed for making, you know, breakthrough happening. What's it going to take to scale these use cases? Right, so we talk about trust. I guess that's an outcome of scaling this and showing that it behaves. We're in experimentation at the moment. Um, how do we move out of experimentation? Is it having vended solutions like GitHub in people's hands and working? Is it homegrown offerings by the banks that come through? In which case, how, how do I move out of experimentation and start delivering value? Well, I'll, I'll say, all of those. I don't think it is about whether it's homegrown or whether it's vendor driven. I think it's about finding cases where, I think part of it, and, and Claire, you'll remember this from your banking days as well. Part of this is also, this is a solution looking for a problem for many people, right? You have people who are looking to, well, don't. All of us know when you mention the stuff about old code, my biggest problem as chief data officer of a bank was looking through code written 15 years ago. Guess what? Today, I would have got all of the first draft of the English translation automatically, it was old SQL written in. I would have gotten all of that. Look at the opportunity. So I think if we focus less on what's the grand, attractive, big, you, you, you saw how conspicuous by its absence was big new business models. No, just solve the old problems, the problems we've all been talking about, old systems, old data, and you know, not able to serve customers because of internal constraints. If we focus on the problems that really matter to the industry, and we focus on AI, non-AI, combination of these things, vendor, non-vendor, then we'll succeed. And I think it's not even we will. There's a small number of banks and insurers that are going there. It's anywhere from 10 to 20% of the banks and insurers that are actually already on that track. And is this going to be a first mover wins everything? Is this going to be... A general technology that everybody deploys and it levels the playing field later. Um, how do you see this working out? Do I need to move immediately? Or am I okay to play the middle path? I, I think what we're seeing, and it goes back to sort of what it takes to scale these things up. It also goes back, Claire, to your point about tuning this to specific verticals and specific task domains, is that those that start early with it have a big advantage because they're figuring out not just the technology itself, but all the processes for risk accepting this technology, the technology for AI governance. Um, we're working with uh, one, one of the largest, one of the top three US banks now, and it, it amazed me. They were able to get us through their uh, approval processes in three months for cloud architecture, for security, for AI governance. And part of the reason that they were able to do that, though, goes back to your point about trust we were actually able to position the AI as risk reducing because one of the biggest risks is actually to miss crucial information. That can torpedo a deal. Information overload is actually dangerous and a source of business risk. And as humans, we're good at thinking strategically and making judgments about relatively small amounts of information. 
But if we try to drink from the fire hose of digital information coming at us, our circuits get overloaded very quickly. Fortunately, uh, AI is able to process more or less unlimited amounts of information. So you can use AI to scour that information uh, ocean in the background and surface to people the things that they really need to be aware of. That can be ris risk reducing. Another step that we take that has been very effective is that we actually don't generate any content that goes in front of a user. So we actually were not classified by the bank as a generative AI solution, even though we use LLM technology and embeddings extensively behind the scenes for analysis. But we have a hard and fast rule that our focus is on making sure you see the information that it could be dangerous if you miss, um, but not on putting information in front of you that might actually be erroneous. I think for me, what will make the scale, and I totally agree with your two points, so I'm going to build on something a bit different, but uh, we need to move out of the use case to go to the value proposition. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the big meaty things we can go after, knowing that, you know, the business model of banking is not going to change. Mm -hmm. The fact that we take deposits, that we manage risk, and that we ensure this trust and this risk is there, and it's exactly your point. But there are a lot of opportunities for a huge value proposition. And the way to do this value proposition is to partner between CSPs, GSI, and AI startups or editors in order to bring this value proposition and to tune it locally to markets. The value proposition in Japan cannot be the same as in France, which is not the same as in the UK, which is not the same as in the US. My context is different. You know, in some countries, you need and you require sovereign cloud. And we all need to acknowledge and recognize that the ecosystem are different. And the way I've seen often when it materializes is a two-page memo that go to the CEO and say, let's make this transformation, which is very effective through your stack in one part of the value chain. And you start this way. And I've seen that implemented in some of the area. And this is really a top management decision. And that brings me to the second you know, part of, of what is needed, which is the cultural change. When you address the personas of the organization, the needs of the board, and you know, some of the uh, chief risk officer, chief data officer, are very different. They are focused on regulation, at least in Europe. And it's very different from a GM or a CEO, which is trying to figure out what can we do in the top line and in generative AI, which is different from the CEO, uh, which is trying to understand how do I make sure I don't burn 200, 300 million doing something that will become commoditized or obsolete in the next two to three years. So each of these personas, we need to clarify what are their needs and then to apply the proper training in their team. Uh, and that's why on my side, I partner with CFT, you know, on the AI, but. I do think we are just scratching the surface of these new jobs and these new roles, and this need to unfold you know, in, uh, in the organization. At the time being, I do think it will come more from people around the table uh, you know, looking at the agenda. I'd love to comment briefly on the importance of partnerships, um, because what we've found working in financial services as an AI specialist is that we don't have the deep financial services workflow expertise. And that's why we've partnered with the London Stock Exchange Group for that. And it turns out that it's actually kind of difficult for a startup to sell into a really large financial institution. And so partnering uh, with the London Stock Exchange Group for distribution has also made it easier for financial institutions to buy from us. At the same time, you may be aware, many of you in this room are probably aware that, that the London Stock Exchange Group has a deep partnership with Microsoft. We're also a Microsoft partner. And one of the things we found, and of course we're multi-cloud, you can build on lots of different clouds, lots of different collaboration platforms, but it makes it awfully easy to be able to just go in with the LSEG market data stack, with the Microsoft technology stack, delivering insights and, and an experience directly within Microsoft um, Teams uh, has worked extremely well. So I, I, I think whoever your partners are, the power of, there's so many different kinds of expertise that are needed here. If you can bring those partners together that bring all the different expertise, it's key. Yeah, and it's what I often call baking the cake more than splitting the cake. <laughs> you know, because to your point, the cloud transformation is yet at the beginning in a lot of markets. Uh, even in fintech, you know, sometimes they're not fully equipped with a cloud stack technology. And what I see a lot of time is 
people, you know, are focused about, oh, I want to take, you know, BigQuery or Redshift or, you know, whatever out. But the story actually needs to be bigger. It's what you mentioned. Let's bake the cake more than splitting it. So perhaps um, picking up on some of the examples that David and Claire and, and others have, have made, I, I get the chance to promote myself for the third time to Chief People Officer. Um, A lot of paychecks coming. <laughs> that's right. I'm just, I'm just hoping my boss is in the audience somewhere. Um, and so if, if I think about, like, who does this impact, right? So we, if, if we're talking about a banker tool that helps them do their job more effectively, if we're talking about a co-pilot, pair programming with your developers, the big transformational change that changes the way we do something, or maybe it's new revenue, who, who, is, who is impacted? Um, and maybe, Brent, this is one to start with, given how mature co-pilot is. Who does, it, who does it help? Who does it replace? Well, I think it, it helps many different uh, stakeholders, not just developers. But you know, for developers, it is a co-pilot. It's not a developer replacer, replacement technology. You do need to have experienced developers that know what they're doing to be able to effectively utilize the tool. At least you know, at this point, um, you know, that's still the case. Um, but it can help a lot of other stakeholders. So you know, security is another area that we're really looking into and, and using uh, AI to you know, look scour the code for security vulnerabilities and to fix vulnerabilities that have been identified through you know, security scanning tools. So you know, I think it can help in a lot of different areas, um, not just um, developers. But I don't think it's going to replace anybody. I think you still need to have those developers. You still need to have security experts. Um, but it will help to address the, the vast shortage that we have of both, particularly on the security side. We don't have a lot of um, people who are experts in code security. Um, and you know, Copilot can really bridge that gap, or those AI technologies. Yeah, make a short glib comment. Your, I think your question is wrong. You asked, who is it going to impact? I would ask, and I would also ask the audience, who is it not going to impact? <laughs> I don't think there's a single person in this group, or amongst us, or amongst the audience, whose job is not going to be impacted. It's only a question of timing, and it's only a question of, to some extent, the, the, the degree of impact. But everybody's job is going to be impacted. And we should all figure out how we're going to work with AI. Uh, not worry about it replacing us, but worry about how we'll do the best job with AI. Um, Karim Lakani at the Harvard Business School often says that you don't need to worry about AI replacing you. You need to worry about a person using AI replacing you. And I think that's, that's absolutely right. You, you won't be able to stay in the game if you're not leveraging these tools. I think we're seeing that with software engineering now. Um, but the the tendency over the past, I think, couple of centuries of economic development has been that when technology makes is complementary to a given skill set and you bring down the cost of a given capability as a result, you actually start needing or wanting to use a lot more of that skill set. And so we'll probably, and you're the expert on this, I'd maybe you have a perspective, but I would imagine that the demand for software engineers will probably rise as each software engineer can do so much more. Well, and the definition of software engineer will expand because with cloud adoption, everything is becoming code. You have infrastructure as code, you have policy as code, reg tech, gov tech. You know, all of this stuff is just code. And, and you have all these different roles that they will become software developers. And, and Copilot does just as good a job at writing you know, queries and, and for policy as code as it does for writing C++. So. Following the pattern of what we're talking about, um, when we're invited back here in a year's time and the six of us are here on this sofa, um, what, what are we going to be saying? What's the, what's the one big takeaway in 12 months' time that we think is going to have occurred in this, this industry? So I, I hope we're talking about some real use cases around uh, old code bases, you know, COBOL. And we, can, we can actually you know, talk about you know, how to address that problem. So I guess that's a hope for next time. So actually, I love the research of uh, Karim Lakani. So I would love that we discuss uh, what he will do further. So they run a study at BCG to see what happened when people work with uh, AI, with the GPTs and the different uh, LLMs. And now they are rerunning because they have all the data with all the LLMs available from uh, Anthropic, uh, you know, from uh, Claude and from Mistral. Um, and I would love that this become a reality and that we have tangible repetitive results that we scale and that we can talk about that in a one year's time in a very secure way. <laughs> I'm quite bullish, and uh, you know, because I'm seeing lots of excitement, and I really want to change uh, in the market. And uh, 
probably you know, in 12 months, uh, I hope we, as a customer, uh, will communicate with you know, LLM, you know, JNI. So it's becoming a sort of a customer facing uh, model. So that's, that's, that is my expectation. I, I think we'll realize that we were all probably a little bit overly optimistic about what generic general purpose LLMs can achieve. Uh, and I think we're starting to see that. It was a theme on the panel today that we'll see more and more that they're just not accurate enough. They're just not reliable enough. It turns out that you need to use them as a tool together with other more specialized techniques and AI solutions to build hybrid systems that can actually tackle the most or augment professionals in tackling uh, the most demanding professional tasks. So a small variation of that. In one year's time, if we're all here, we're going to talk about two things. One, why is it that 80 to 90% of the banks, insurers, fintechs, were really disappointed with the millions <laughs> that they invested in Gen AI? We're also going to look at what is it that the remaining 5 to 10% or 10 to 20% did right? Because mark my words, there are banks that we know, I think, in this group or insurers that are already running away very fast. And these are not the ones who are publicizing their big use cases. No, no. These are the ones who are quietly making dramatic uh, jumps, right? And I think we'll be here analyzing what did that 10% get right, which the remaining 90 did not. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I've seen at least three hands go up, um, one at the back. I don't know if we've got any roving microphones. In Japan, I think in FinTech, the, the kind of big winners have actually been the telecoms coming into financial services, tying up with some already internet um, services, but PayPay, I think, has almost half of Japan now um, signed up in almost no time. Um, so there's definitely some big new entrants come into financial services, on the other hand, we heard you talk about how incumbents are still worried about using cloud services, and, but they have a lot of good data. So my question is, is it too late or are these AI tools going to save some of these dinosaurs to kind of bring their data to, to compete with the internet bankers and the soft uh, smartphone new entrants? And uh, if so, what are the kind of aspects of AI that you know haven't happened yet, but will suddenly allow people to pick out, you know, that 50 years of consumer data they've got and turn it into a treasure trove? Thank you. Can I take that? So, uh, th thank you for that question. I think it's a very good question, and uh, I, I would say, you know, observing what's going on right now, AI could be a real trigger for for the dinosaurs you mentioned uh, is changing. I, I think this time is the, the time for the, for the Japanese traditional financial institutions to be changed. I have been engaged in, uh, in a Japanese financial institutions since mid-2000, so it's been more than uh, you know, 20 years. But this is uh, the most exciting moment uh, from my experience. And uh, everybody is so excited about you know, the potential. So, uh, this should be a trigger uh, for them to change. That, that's my. Very good. Maybe I'll ask um, if there's another question from the audience rather than doubling up on the same same comment. Uh, yes, please. Actually, this is not a question or my observation. I was looking as a customer uh, from the financial institution, what are you going to give it to me using AI? And through the discussion, actually, I didn't find uh, any customer proposition that you are thinking or more thinking more about how to cut cost or create more sales. Uh, so I think uh, that's a point for me, that there's actually really starting of the AI. You are, you are not really thinking what can you bring to the customer using AI. I'll give an example. When we started internet banking, uh, the proposition was anytime, anywhere. I mean, with that, we can do that now. I think AI, we don't have a similar proposition. I would uh, like to request you, if you think you know, Good to share with us. There are probably lots of propositions depending on the business, but to give you one example, um, in investment banking, what we see is really three specific areas where the banks are seeking to augment the performance, especially of their senior bankers. That's prospecting, um, which is a cost center because you're doing a lot of work on spec as an investment banker, and so if you can prospect more intelligently 
and more effectively convert prospects. That becomes a driver of revenue and of productivity. The second area is around uh, actually winning business and, and developing additional business with clients, so meeting effectiveness, um, winning more uh, once you've got uh, an active opportunity in front of you, and then deal execution. Uh, and all three of those are impacted by the quality of the insights that you're receiving. And so if you're spending less time looking for information as a senior banker or less time being blindsided by it and trying to recover and more time actually driving uh, opportunities with the right prospect at the right moment, you see a lot more revenue. No. Okay. So I was just going to say, I think that's not from the client's perspective. That's from, I mean, that's from your client's perspective, but from the end client. I'll give you a, I know you're probably looking for one great answer. I think there was some stuff about personalization, which will probably fit in that. I personally believe it's a different one. I think financial services is not as complex as those of us in the industry for a long time make it out to be. We've made it complex through a mix of math and regulation and internal first line, second line, third line, fourth line. So the real benefit to the customer is that banks will leave their shit in the back room and get their real, you know, what they're here for much faster to you. And that I see a lot of evidence that the stuff that holds banks, insurers back, most of that disappears. And then you don't get a new service. You just get what you were meant to get in the first place far quicker, far better. I think that's the, the corollary is that if you have people coming to you that actually have better information, you're going to get a better experience as a client. You're going to get more value out of the relationship. First of all, we've hit the top of our time. Um, I will gladly volunteer my panel's time to continue this discussion in the networking events. Please come and find them. Um, hopefully this has been helpful hearing real examples of what's going on, get behind the publications and the hype and see what's, what's really driving value in the industry with AI. Um, thank you all for being here and joining us and thanks to the panel for a wonderful discussion.